well, let me just go jive right in. Um, so this is just sort of an overview of what I'm going to try to cover. And um, so you just you can look at that. You have it shrunk down in your little pink sheet there so you can look at what we're going to try to cover and see. It is very dense stuff, a lot of this. And I might go on and on. So if you want to interrupt me, of course, then we won't get to the end. But you might want to interrupt me with questions um, as we go along. Um, so let's dive right in. The first thing is, I understand from Steve that um, our ch chairwoman here asked specifically about trade with the Arctic countries and to talk about that. And many of you brought up your interest in trade as something that you're either doing right now or we'd like to see Maine do more of. And here's an example, and I suggested to see that we get Dana Eisness to the commission to talk about what she does. Because this is an example of where the state of Maine is already engaging internationally and doing really interesting things around trade um, and moving goods back and forth to other countries, selling our products, you know, making these kinds of relationships. And we do not have a trade agreement with these countries largely that we are engaging with. And so the point I want to make here, and I may disappoint everybody who spoke up saying how interested you are in trade, because I'm going to talk about sort of the other side of things, which is this trade policy part. And as you heard from Steve, you know, that's part, a big part, like a very large part of the mission of the commission is to look at trade policy and how trade policy affects businesses, workers, healthcare, environment, you name it. Um, and so this is all you're going to see about trade, I'm sorry to say. And we'll need to get someone from the Maine International Trade Center or Dana, who, who works there, to come and talk about this part of it. So, and this is sort of my first point. There's a lot of people who say, well, I'm for trade. Um, and that's not necessarily the same thing as being for trade agreements. And this commission has over the years actually um, came out, come out with you know, policy decisions and resolutions and letters, which are all posted on our website, advising our members of Congress and others that we do not support certain proposed trade agreements that the United States has um, negotiated or is in the process of negotiating. Um, and so, I, I, so, so that's a lot of what I'm going to talk about, and, and it's about, it, it's issues that I work on every day is about half of my job, is that trade agreements, whether they're free trade agreements between two countries or more, in a, like a regional um, grouping of countries, or the, the World Trade Organization, which many, many countries are part of, and the U.S. is part of, um, they set rules, and a lot of those rules actually have a very direct or can have a direct impact on uh, what you can do in a state or on the federal level uh, in your own domestic policies um, because they are written in a way to advance trade as sort of the number one thing that happens, um, and sometimes if trade is number one, everything else might not be, uh, might be kind of, you know, smushed over. And that's exactly what some of these trade agreements do. And sometimes that trade uh, isn't necessarily something that when you look at it, you're saying, well, who is this actually benefiting? And that's part of, part of the discussion that we have. Now, just to step back a bit, just give you some background on who actually is involved with joint trade policy. And I think the, the point here is that state governments basically are not involved and we're very marginally consulted. However, a trade agreement uh, can and does um, affect state economic development, state domestic policy around the environment, around healthcare, around any of these things. Um, so it's very important. That's why the commission was set up was to, like, finding out how, how do these trade agreements affect us? Are they the kind of trade agreements we would want to have or not? So one of the things here is that trade policy is really decided in between Congress and the president 
based on the Constitution and a lot of the authority that Congress has, has over tariffs and um, trade has been given up to some extent to the executive branch, to the president, to do the negotiations. And Congress has reserved for itself still the right to turn, um, to agree or not agree to trade agreements. However, it has limited um, what it can do about those trade agreements. For example, unlike a regular piece of legislation, um, under rules that Congress has repeatedly adopted called Fast Track or Trade Promotion Authority, Congress gives up the authority to amend legislation, amend um, you know, uh, trade agreements. Now, that being said, Congress still can vote no entirely on the whole thing. And because of that leverage, um, has been able to negotiate provisions after trade agreements have been completely negotiated by the president of this country and other countries and signed, you know, in that big signing ceremony. And then members of Congress say, well, we don't like it unless you fix X, Y, and Z. And that's exactly what happened with the renegotiation of NAFTA, uh, which I was going to talk about some more uh, later on in this presentation. And the other thing to note there is that the Trade Promotion Authority, which is always highly controversial whether or not to pass it, and it's a kind of a bipartisan controversy <laughs> that both Republicans and Democrats um, either like really want to have it because they think it's important to get trade agreements enacted or they're very very concerned about it because they think it takes away the sovereignty of um, uh, of both you know Congress but then also ultimately of these trade agreements sort of taking away the the uh, uh, legislative authority um, that, that you would like to have because once the trade agreement is in place, it's an international agreement and if it has all kinds of rules that say you can't do certain things, then that has potentially can supersede what Congress might want to do in the future. So it is very controversial and uh, it has not been reauthorized. It expired July 1st of this year. The Biden administration has not yet requested renewal and most people think that they are unlikely to well, they won't unless it's after the midterms and then they might possibly but as we will see they are taking kind of a go slow attitude about tr negotiating trade agreements under the new administration and and actually that's a continuation in many respects from what the trump administration also was doing around trade so it's kind of an interesting moment, actually. Um, but right now, we don't have this fast track in place. So the state's role, as I said, is kind of not much there. Um, I happen to serve on something called the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Committee. Um, it's one of a whole bunch of, of committees that we do get to see some of the text that um, the government is thinking of um, putting forward in a trade negotiation and we can comment on it, but usually it's like 24 hours or 48 hours we get to look at this. And uh, as, our, as Chris Taub knows, <laughs> these are legal things and trying to analyze, you know, say 45 pages over, you know, 24 hours and give good advice on it is pretty much impossible. And there's a lot of um, secrecy, like I had to be investigated by the FBI and I literally filled out a 60 page application to get clearance so I could look at this thing and then, you know, they don't really listen. So, um, but this is why I circled, um, this is the Intergovernmental Policy Advisory Committee, that's state and local government. And those are the ch different trade committees. Again, it's in your pink sheets, but kind of small. But all those committees on the bottom of this slide, they all represent different um, industries. And so it's very much, a, 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 and they have the same access, you know, g getting to look at text and really have a preferred seat at the table. And that can be very good if you're representing the blueberry industry and we're concerned about, you know, blueberries and we want to make sure that they, um, you know, that any trade agreement has sort of a preference for blueberries in whatever way that might be done. But it might be a concern when you have, um, say, the pharmaceuticals 
committee, which is interested in always keeping pharmaceutical prices as high as possible. And so our doctor, Dr. Case, would, would know and has worked on these issues. The issues, around, or also the intellectual property committee, we know that those have implications for, um, you know, if you have a patent that goes on forever in a day, then it never becomes a generic medicine and then it keeps prices high and it, it, it um, prevents many people from accessing affordable health care. So there's two sides to this and certainly um, these committees are heavily weighted to, to represent particular sectors of the economy, not kind of these um, governmental issues, which is why, as um, the Honorable John Patrick said, you know, it's very, has, it was quite significant that Maine decided to create this commission that we're sitting in right now and try to tackle some of these issues and provide advice because it wasn't coming from other places. Um, so here's some of the things that we could talk about today. We probably won't have time to talk about many of them. Um, tariffs, these different principles of national treatment, technical barriers to trade. Um, our, our former uh, staff, um, Locke Kiermeyer, said there's a big report about technical barriers to trade. And he, he read through that one day and he said, or looked through it and said, everything in here is a policy that I thought was like a really kind of like exactly what we do in the legislature, you know, but it's in this report as a terrible technical barrier to trade. So these are things that we're going to talk about a little bit and we'll over the course, I hope, of the next year that we're um, meeting. Um, so tariffs, here we have a great Maine lobster. Some of you may be familiar with the fact that when the Trump administration um, came up with um, a tariff policy around steel and aluminum, where they imposed additional tariffs on steel and aluminum as a way to basically get at overproduction of steel and aluminum, which was driving prices down by China, what ended up happening is that China and the European Union imposed tariffs on a variety of products that had nothing to do with steel and aluminum, including lobsters and, uh, well, Kentucky whiskey <laughs> um, because of, you know, Mitch McConnell. So that was like targeted really at him, not at anything else. And so these tariffs can actually turn into sort of a tariff war, but this is something that is used frequently to protect a domestic industry from uh, unfair competition abroad. That's what the idea of the steel and aluminum tariffs was. was. It could be a national security uh, issue, which is what the, the, the Trump administration said that its aluminum and steel tariffs were about. I think they were really more about the first one, protecting domestic um, employment. Um, but that was a more legitimate rationale, so that's what they use. But then you can get it for retaliation, which is what I just discussed, whereas it could end it up harming you in all kinds of other ways that you didn't really think, and you get to be kind of collateral damage in, a, in this uh, tariff war that's going on. Um, so these are some of the concepts. I'm not going to go through most favored nation. We can talk about these sorts of things, but this is part of the WTO, and it's about you know, if, if you're all members of the WTO, then you can't give some uh, one member, you know, a kind of a, a cheap way of trading their products to your country and another member give them a big high tariff because you don't like them for some reason. OK, so the idea it's sort of a it's a fairness, but it's also around tariffs. Um, but one exception to that is you can do this free trade agreement with a particular country. If you cover enough things, then it's considered OK and you can have a different kind of level of tariffs and all of that. So this is getting into, you know, wonky stuff. Um, national treatment, another concept here, and a very important one, which um, has to do with the idea that if you pass legislation, it's kind of like you can't discriminate against other states within the United States under the U.S. Commerce Clause. Well, in the international trade sphere, under the World, World Trade Organization, um, all the countries there agree that they're not going to discriminate against a foreign products. Now you can immediately see how this might come up against what legislators and executive branch um, policy people do at the state and federal level, which is of course to try to promote um, our products, to try to promote employment in the state of Maine, 
to try to do what on a variety of things, whether it's tax policy or other things that would assist those um, businesses. But this can run up against this concept that if you're not providing a similar or the same level of um, support to a foreign product or foreign company that is you know, trying to trade that policy, then you could run up against this concept of national treatment. And so to give you an example of this, which was from 2019, but this is a, a list of 10 states that had um, renewable energy policies where they coupled you know, the renewable energy policy with you know, trying to promote um, jobs for people within their states, you know, to say install solar panels or to, um, if they were using uh, materials or the, the, the turbines were put together in the state or whatever. And so you see in the right hand side, there's a tax incentive credit. So all you people in the labor committee, you know, you, you think about this stuff. You're like, hey, how are we gonna do this? We wanna promote these policies. We wanna promote these businesses. Great, we'll join up economic development with our policy over on the left. And then what happens? Well, what happens is India says, well, we're gonna sue and we make file a complaint under the WTO saying that these state policies violate the WTO principle because they discriminate against India. And of course, the reason India did this is that the United States had already filed a similar kind of case against India, saying that you're you know, providing too much subsidy to your solar panel uh, industry. So this was a retaliation, but of course, the states were caught in the middle. So this is just kind of a cautionary tale. It doesn't mean that there aren't policies that don't run afoul of um, international trade rules but it is something to be aware of, and it's something to be aware of not just in this commission, but in committees all over you know, the legislature, as well as at the executive branch. Um, and here's another example of a policy that Maine also has something about this, which is that the US used to have a policy about labeling uh, meat. Um, and if you said this meat is from the United States of America, then you had to actually have produced it in the United States of America and then processed it and everything from soup to nuts, so to speak. And Mexico and Canada challenged this policy and said, because there's a lot of meat that moves across state borders or international borders, and it might be born in Mexico, processed in the United States and, you know, something else up in Canada, I don't know, you know. So this policy, they said, this is too complicated, it's too expensive, it's aimed at us. Mexico and Canada, you're, trying, you're discriminating against us. Um, and they went to the WTO and the WTO indeed said, yep, you're right, you can't have this policy. Um, and as a result, you can, uh, you know, the WTO authorized Mexico and Canada to impose uh, sanctions, over a billion dollars of sanctions against the US unless Congress repealed it, which Congress did, not wanting to pay billions of dollars in sanctions. Now, one thing to mention is that the European Union does have a policy on, you know, um, country of origin labeling that hasn't been invalidated yet. So there may be ways to do this. But what Congress did was it just said, OK, well, forget it. Well, there's actually a lot of farmers in Maine and in other states that would like to see a policy that allowed labeling. They didn't say, made, you know, this is uh, U.S. beef when it was actually grown in Mexico you know, but just processed in the United States. Um, and I just wanted to point out that Maine has a policy on labeling of Maine meat and poultry. Now, the WTO hasn't noticed this policy. It's probably perfectly fine. It doesn't run up against these issues necessarily. But I'm just trying to give you an example of where these trade rules can have, an implica have implications for policies that many people, and then this one, certainly goes to Senator Hickman's wheelhouse, you know, farm policy. And so this is an example of, um, you know, the intersection of trade policy and a, a different kind of policy, which is, again, about promoting main, um, you know, quality local meat. And there may be good reasons to promote quality local meat, if I may say so. 
And this is just a quick thing about um, that I just saw in, like a, in a trade publication like two days ago or yesterday, I don't know, whenever I put this in, um, where Brazil is suing the European Union saying that your rules are to protect people against salmonella are too strict and um, they should only apply to fresh poultry meat. You sh they shouldn't apply to processed poultry meat because that ends up getting cooked and no worries about salmonella. Well, I don't know about you, but I, <laughs> I might be worried about that myself. And um, so this is a, actually a live dispute that they want, they plan to take to the WTO and they want to go into consultations about whether or not the European Union is violating the, um, the food safety rules, which is what sanitary and phytosanitary means in trade speak, is food safety. And so this is an example, like straight from, you know, yesterday's paper, if you read the kind of papers I read. So a quick thing, if you actually read through um, Representative Deb Hutton's little speech there that we just got from Steve, she mentioned um, takings law in NAFTA, and what she was referring to in that is investor state dispute settlement, which is the system of, um, that basically allows corporations to complain about state and federal laws that they say take their profits. And they can go to an arbitration panel of three lawyers who tend to work on these trade issues and have built in conflicts of interest. And you don't need to take my word for that. I, it, it's, there's a lot of papers out about this. Um, and they can get a judgment potentially that would lead to the state or federal government having to get rid of their law or you know, pay huge, huge damages. Um, and I just want to point out as kind of the historian here that the Maine Citizen Trade Policy Commission has repeatedly opposed ISDS. And it has been used to challenge state policies and particular, I, I note the, the last example I put there of Cook Aquaculture, which I believe has uh, operations here in the state of Maine, threatened Washington state lawmakers that they were going to bring an ISDS claim against them because the Washington state lawmakers uh, came up with uh, legislation that did not allow Atlantic salmon to be um, grown in aquaculture in the Pacific because it would be an invasive species in the Pacific. So Cook Aquaculture said they were going to seek 60, 76 million dollars in damages uh, if the ban passed. Um, fortunately, Washington state legislators did not blink. They passed it anyway, but under the new USMCA, uh, new NAFTA, US, Mexico, Canada agreement, uh, it did phase out ISDS between US and Canada and Cook is a Canadian company so they can take advantage of this law which a domestic company couldn't, but they still have three years to make good on this threat. So, you know, that could completely upend the policy that the Washington state legislators and the governor uh, adopted. So that's just a super quick <laughs> overview of that. And the remaining couple of minutes, um, just a quick thing about what's happening now. I mentioned that, you know, they haven't renewed fast track in Congress. The Biden administration hasn't actually suggested doing it. There's always a couple of senators that are like, why aren't we doing this? It means we're anti-trade. Um, but as, as I said, it's very political and um, on a bipartisan basis. What has been happening is there is a new version of NAFTA, which is the North American Free Trade Agreement between Mexico, Canada, and the United States. It has been renamed the U.S.-Mexico-Canada Agreement. Um, and it did make some changes, both, I, I think, the result of... Um, U.S. Trade Representative Lighthizer under the Trump administration and then Trade Commissioner Catherine Tai working for the Biden administration. But before that, she was actually the counsel for the um, House of Representatives Trade Committee and helped negotiate some of the reforms that are in this new NAFTA. So I, I put together a little slide and there's a lot of things about the new NAFTA that 
I personally have a lot of concerns about, and obviously I have a bias here. I work for a group that is concerned about things like country of origin labeling and you know, whether or not you're allowed to um, ban certain pesticides that you think um, you know, shouldn't be out in the environment. Um, and this agreement has provisions in it that definitely restrict or make it more difficult to do some of the things that Maine legislators have been doing for the last 20 years. And some of those things are things we could talk about at a future point. But one of the things that did happen is that because, both because of Larry Lighthizer not liking ISDS, thinking it is, takes away the sovereignty of a country is unnecessary um, to give corporations this power to just you know, sue for billions of dollars. Um, he wanted to get rid of it. Uh, and in fact, the, the new version of NAFTA does get rid of it with respect to Canada, but it's phased out over three years, so they can still bring claims, legacy claims for three years. But then it's phased out, and that's a very significant thing because in the European Union, they're like throwing this thing in every single agreement they do. Um, and then there are changes that were negotiated by Catherine Tai, representing the um, House, which basically improved the provisions around prescription drugs, which I already mentioned, those, how those, pres those provisions can keep drug prices high, and also improved the labor provisions. And I put in the packet, so turn to your pink packet, you will see there are some articles there. One is the Congressional Research Service, um, talking about the labor rules, and they're already using them to implement stronger um, protections um, in Mexico um, than have ever been done. So it, it's, it's really, that's significant. There's also, I put in there a policy brief that I wrote that compares um, some changes that were put in the USMCA around the environment chapter and perhaps around climate that, um, and compares those with what the European Union is doing and some changes and some reforms there to try to make these agreements a little more um, environmental. And um, so, so those are some things. And the, oh, I also have an article in there about what's going on with Mexico, which is trying to ban glyphosate and is being told by a lot of corporations that make glyphosate, well, one, um, Bayer or formerly Monsanto, that they're not allowed to do this because of provisions in USMCA. I happen to disagree. I'm in the process of writing up a little paper on that, which I haven't been able to get to yet, but um, that is a live issue and it just shows whatever you think about Mexico and whether they should be allowed to do this. I do know that a number of the things that Mexico has been doing are very similar to things that people are doing here in the state of Maine. And so the question is, I mean, this is not just an agreement that applies to Mexico. This is an agreement that applies to all three countries that are part of it. And it's, you know, you heard the expression, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. Well, that's how it works. You can't just pick and choose these rules. They apply to everybody, whether you like them or not. And so you can't just say, I just want this to apply to Mexico. So there are some issues in there that are worth, um, you know, paying attention to. Um, and particularly if this agreement ends up being kind of a model for future trade agreements, um, which could come down the road. So this is just about, I think, my last slide. What the U.S. is doing is um, engaging with the European Union on this Trade and Technology Council. It is not a trade negotiation. It is a discussion about how they might be able to cooperate about a whole bunch of issues. And I'm actually going to attend one of these um, working groups on Thursday, virtually. So I'll know more about whether it, I think anything's happening there or not after that. But it is, it's interesting to me because it seems to me that the current US trade representative is interested in looking at maybe some different ways of engaging on trade policy that don't involve these restrictive trade agreements. And so I think that's a very interesting development and it kind of follows along to some extent from what the Trump administration was doing. So it's maybe a, a, a tipping point in a way in trade policy or maybe not. We'll find out as we go forward. I provided a little glossary. So when you hear these acronyms, you'll know what they're talking about more or less. And then here are some trade agreements that you might hear about 
The one I would point out besides USMCA is um, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which basically I think its current membership of this commission who, was, uh, who were around when this was being debated know how controversial that was. The Trump administration did not um, decide to sign it, but the remaining parties did. Um, they renamed it Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, which of course I would just say just because you change the name doesn't actually change the nature of the agreement. But they did suspend some of the provisions, again, these, these uh, patent provisions dealing with drug pricing um, that the U.S. had wanted at that time, but probably doesn't anymore because Catherine Tai took them out of the USMCA before Congress agreed to it. So, you know, there's some, as I said, there's some interesting things going on. So that is that. Um, and <laughs> in the remaining 10 minutes, I'm happy to... <laughs> Answer any questions? Oh, I've got to keep my mask on. Thanks very much. Yes, questions. Senator Guerin. Thank you. And this question is for you, Honorable Sharon Treat. Yes. I, our committee did quite a lot of work on the chicken labeling yeah. and I know we sent some letters, and I wondered if we had any response from any of the, the advocating we did for the labeling of country of origin in meats. Do you know, or is that something students I, I don't think, me? you know, I really don't think we got the answers back on that. They were, I mean, they would be in the, and probably posted online, I don't know, because it was like two years ago that right. this happened. But they were the kind of answer, non-answers that you get when they say, thank you so much for your thoughtful letter about blah, blah, blah. We're working very hard to, you know, do, do great things. <laughs> it basically was completely non-responsive. And then we wrote some other, um, and, and we even wrote some background um, questions for some members of Congress as well for some hearings that were happening. But when it came to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Trade Office, they were not very responsive. But that's the, exactly the issue that, like, Brazil is raising with the European Union is exactly the kind of issues that we were discussing in this commission around Chinese poultry being, you know, sold in the state without the same, having to follow the same kind of safety rules that our um, producers have to have to follow. Yeah. Are there other comments or questions? Anyone? I, ha I do have one. I'm curious since we are seen as, as was commented earlier as a leading state in having a commission that addresses these issues. Um, I'm wondering if, if there is coordination that happens amongst states that are working on these things to perhaps bring more leverage or bring a, a coordinated approach to the table in working with the federal government or other entities. I, I know John Patrick can address this to some extent as well. You know, there has been over the years through the National Conference of State Legislatures, um, there's actually been resolutions passed by um, NCSL around ISDS and some of these trade issues. Um, so I know that there's that. I mean, some years ago there was an organization that actually was involved with working with all the state commissions and trying to, you know, get more of them and, and sort of share information. But that organization has gone, you know, is no longer operating. Um, but I think that, you know, because I know I've, I've given, I used to chair the insurance committee, and so there's a, the National Association of Insurance Legislators has annual meetings, and we would have, you know, some of these issues brought to the table there, because, like, one of the issues is what some of these trade agreements basically took over regulation of insurance and put in the federal government, even though it's a state, um, competent state authority under our current, you know, federalist system and, you know, so that's the kind of thing that can happen. So they were, you know, understandably concerned about that. So I think there are some of the 
But I, I think sometimes there isn't the coordination between the trade promotion part of things, which the main international trade center and the economic development department, and then on the other side, the sort of domestic policy and where some of these trade agreements can really interfere with the domestic policy that you might be wanting to do. And I don't always think that the, you know, some of the states don't really understand the, the other side of it. They're like, trade, trade is good, great, let's do more of it, let's enter in more agreements, as opposed to kind of communicating, say, with their AG's office and some others about what are the actual implications of this language right here, and do we need to have that language in order, you know, to sell more blueberries or whatever it is, you know. Thank you. Other questions? I do have one more. <laughs> oh, yes. Go ahead, Mr. Patrick. I'd just like to agree with what uh, the Honorable Sharon Treat said. Uh, and I would probably say that 10 years ago when more commissions were forming, there was some coordination. We actually went, I can't remember if it was New Hampshire or Massachusetts, we actually went to try to coordinate with them in that, but I would have to say since then probably there's not much coordination uh, in, the, in the light, but uh, I mean it would be nice if they'd continue on and I think a lot of that had to do with what was going on 10, 12 years ago versus now in that, but uh, not as much as it was in, in that. And even though we've been nationally recognized that national recognition comes at a plus from some respects, but a lot of people that want to have these multinational corporations and, and like who want to get things into their things don't like us, so we're, I would say we're probably a thorn in a lot of people's sides with our recommendations that we brought forth based on the value to main citizens, main jobs, and, and the like, so, but if that helps. Thanks for both of those. Yeah, that was helpful. Other, I do have one other question, and, and this is for Mr. Taub. <laughs> um, just it, are, are there situations where the AG would get involved in um, representing or advocating ma a main position in these situations? Uh, that's a good question. We don't. We we generally don't get involved in those kind of policy discussions, like what what would be a good policy for the state or what would be a bad policy. What we do get involved in sometimes is sort of looking at proposed legislation and assessing whether there's potential um, legal challenges that could be mounted to it. So um, the Commerce Clause comes up qu quite a bit when the state tries to, to, to regulate in the area of, of um, business. Um, there's federal immigration law that comes into play. Um, there's Supremacy Clause issues. So I don't know if this answers your question, but I guess the short answer is we don't really get involved in the policy side, but we do try to help in terms of you know crafting the legislation in a way that's going to avoid potential challenges. Go ahead. Yeah, if I could just add to that, the main AG's office has been involved, though, and this is again some years past, um, around a couple of issues in terms of advocating with other AGs around the country to keep certain things out of trade agreements, including ISDS being one of them. But specifically, you know, the, the attorney generals were in, had a consent decree involving tobacco regulation, and, and, and you, you're, I'm sure, very familiar with that. And one of the, the, one of the reasons that ISDS is sort of on the ropes, in a way, um, from a policy point of view, at least in this country, is that it was used to challenge tobacco regulations in um, the country of Australia, saying that restrictions on labeling you know, how we have labels like this causes cancer or whatever. So uh, Australia had um, po a policy that actually had these very graphic, horrible-looking pictures that took over the whole uh, package. And so Philip Morris sued them using this, you know, ISDS provision actually from some sort of unrelated trade agreement with Hong Kong. So it's just, the whole thing is kind of sketchy. But they sued for huge amounts of, of money. And one of the things about these cases is it costs, like, on average $10 million just to defend them. So you haven't even been socked with the damages. 
And so the att attorneys general around the country, you know, oppose the, the use of this and kind of weighed in on that. And they've also, I know that there have been some letters, and I think some of these might even be on our website because we joined in, but there were some letters on the insurance issue um, when that was coming up in Congress about sort of moving that insurance policy to an international trade thing, and also on the prescription drug issues, which have been front and center, because that's, again, where these trade agreements have been used to lock in certain policies that are above and beyond what our patent policies are um, or could be, or so that you could never change those policies in the future if you wanted to. And so that's another area where governors and AGs have, have kind of gotten involved. But again, as um, Reverend Patrick said, that was, you know, going back a couple of, a couple of years. Yeah. Great, thank you, that's helpful. Other comments on this part of the meeting? No. I'm seeing none. I think um, we need to, the public comment part, is that, that's next on the agenda, is that? Yeah, I don't know that we have any, but uh, <laughs> I, I did, I did uh, send out a request, uh, uh, not a request, a notification that if somebody couldn't be here but wanted to submit comments that they could, I have not received any. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And then um, the next uh, item on the agenda is a discussion of next steps. I think we have discussed the idea of, uh, we also would want to talk about when we would meet next, and uh, Steve, what else do you have in mind there? Uh, that's really it. Um, I don't know, uh, sort of, it seems a little bit that the direction is up in the air because we don't know exactly what's going to happen with the legislation and in terms of we'll be back in session on January 5th. Uh, which will make it so I can't staff the commission, but I'm happy to assist until then. Um, so that's a consideration to keep in mind. But um, certainly if you, there was discussion about a subcommittee coming up with draft language, I'm happy to be a part of that. Um, and obviously you have your appeal pending on Thursday. Um, so uh, maybe it makes sense that you and I touch base after that. But. Absolutely, we, will, we can touch base on those items and those folks who have uh, volunteered to serve on the, the subcommittee. Yes, Ms. Street. Just a quick question for Steve and wondering how far your, your helpfulness is allowed to extend. But from time to time, I mean, I just see all kinds of articles all the time, and I wouldn't want to inundate the commission members with it. But I think there are things happening, and some of those are potentially have, uh, have an impact on Maine. So I didn't know if, if I sent some to see if those were things that could be forwarded around to the commission from time to time at least uh, as kind of a minimal level of just keeping people in the loop about things that are happening right now. And I mean, other people obviously come across stuff as well. I think that would be very helpful, okay. so thank you, yes. Yep, I'm happy to forward anything that you send along. And then the, the question that it brings to mind for me uh, especially for those who've served on the commission before, is really um, what processes or vehicles have we used to identify issues we should be putting some attention on so as we form an agenda for our next meeting or have a situation that arises that we need to address, we, we, we know what we want to be talking about. So are there any, uh, any experience that people would bring to the table on that, I would ask? Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the things I always bring up to new members and stuff. In 2002, I met Representative Deb Hutton, whose name has been uh, bantered about on some of the uh, dialogue and testimony. Uh, she gave me a copy of a documentary by Bill Moyers call, called Trading Democracy. If any of you have an opportunity to find that and look at that, you will be able to find out how these international trade agreements are done, and uh, it'll, it will really enlighten you, and that's how I actually got involved with supporting the bill, bringing forward for the Citizens Trade Policy Commission, and uh, I've been active ever since. So that's a good thing if you, uh, Trading Democracy by Bill Moyers. Senator Miermont. Thank you, Madam Chair, and briefly, uh, another opportunity that comes up that it, it's up in the air right now. Other governments will invite 
us or legislators or members of this committee in particular it, to come and experience things in their country. That seems to be cut off for the last year and a half. But we'll be starting again. I know that um, Turkey and Taiwan are both places that like to have regular, maybe every two year type of exchanges so we can understand better. So there's a very good way to get to know how they work on trade as well as other issues. Uh, when those are established again, I encourage people to take advantage of them. I know Senator Patrick did when he was in, and the, that information has been really invaluable to me for a bigger global perspe perspective. Thanks. Great, thank you. And then the other question I would have is, is there, I'm thinking of almost a, an early warning system. Is that you, uh, Commissioner Treat, that could kind of give us a heads up if there's something we should be paying attention to? Yeah, I'll try. I mean, I think right now what the main thing that's happening is this Trade and Technology Council, and it's, it's a little unclear, but, it, but it's broad ranging. And I think that if there's information about what's happening on that, again, you know, so much of this is behind closed doors, and that's a problem because then it's done and it's kind of too late to influence it, basically. But that is something that's an ongoing, and there are, I, somebody, maybe it was you, somebody mentioned digital platforms, digital issues, or I don't, I thought I heard that, but um, that, that is one of the issues. Um, and I know that Maine has digital privacy laws, for example, that um, are different from the federal government that doesn't have the same thing. So those are some issues that I know are coming up um, in that, and I can at least keep an eye on it and share what I hear about it um, with you. Yeah. Great. Yeah, that would be very helpful. And I, well, I think it was me with the, I'm pretty sure I brought up the privacy because yeah. we, we do, uh, I think, uh, anticipate in the near future some kind of uh, U.S. government action to right. address uh, right. privacy issues. So yeah. yes. yes, Representative Crockett. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Th just to follow up on um, Treat's question. I think, you know, I know, I guess Wade uh, Merritt was not able to join us today. I don't know if he's on the line, but I think he would be a great resource for um, any hot uh, topics that we may be able to help uh, address. If only we could get him to participate. And load up and come over here, then take our sheep or our cotton or our grains over. So I'm just really curious as to what trade levels or levers and mechanisms are there that might be able to help. I, I mean, you're right on <laughs> on that. And one of the 10 workshops or working groups for this Trade and Tech Council is on supply chains. And there also was a Biden administration rulemaking or something where basically it's on global supply chain issues. And the, I know that where I work at ITP, we submitted comments on that. But there's a lot going on around that. And that might be something to, in terms of a future topic to look at. Um, you could put together a good agenda probably around those issues. Yeah. And then I would also. Um, ask you, Ms. McBrady, if that's something that you are hearing from your uh, farmers and, and other producers that is, or is an item of concern that we should be addressing. Um, Export-wise, not necessarily, but domestically, yes. Uh, for instance, just simply the lack of truck drivers being